Hello everyone, I am Bartolo for Gallery Teachers and we are producing a series of videos about TEFL, which is teaching English as a foreign language. Today we are going to talk about how to become a YouTube celebrity to help your business as an English teacher. All of these videos, including the workshops for teacher training, are available on our website for our pro members and I'm leaving a link in the description. If you are watching us on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. Today we have a very special guest. She is uh, an English teacher and the founder of the school Fantastic English. She has a very successful YouTube channel among the Romanian community. And if you use YouTube to improve your English or to gather ideas to spark your classes, and if you happen to speak Romanian, and I do, it's very likely that you already know her. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rita from Fantastic English. Oh, we just like, yay, some sort yeah. of... <laughs> Uh, it's uh, well. It's an honor to hear that. I, I feel to, to be here. I feel uncomfortable every time that happens. Even if uh, people tell me like, "Why would you? You're, like you're really, really popular here. Who doesn't know about you?" And I like I I, I still I feel like uh, I disagree with that. But probably the numbers talk for themselves. So yeah, um, I've been um, been trying to improve the people's people's lives through education here, both in Romania and Moldova, and. Uh, abroad because there's a lot of uh, Moldovans and Romanians who don't live in their country who have emigrated and are currently living in the States and UK and obviously all over the world. So I feel that what I'm doing uh, helps a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people. And this makes me, this makes me uh, feel like I am really doing something important, you know, like uh, Viktor Frankl said, like men's search for meaning in that book. He says that when there's a why, there's a how. So I have my why. I want to change people's lives through education. So that's what I'm doing. I have a good story about you. Um, I have a Romanian friend who moved to Canada and she asked for my advice. So I started browsing channels that uh, taught English to Romanian on YouTube and I found you. And it was so much fun that I've spent the evening watching your videos. You explained the meaning of We Are The Champions by The Queen, which is one of the most popular songs in the world. Yet just a few understand that it's not about winning a football match. Like the more you teach, the more you learn. I think you'll agree with that. Like as teachers, we're constantly learning. And I, I can safely say that I started improving my English for real when I started teaching it because I was already fluent. But when I looked through the course books and I tried to prepare some innovative and interesting creative ways of explaining, for example, the, the, some sort of grammar topics, I found that I actually started uh, to understand this language even better. And I actually improved. So uh, one way to, to learn language is to try to teach it or to look at this language like you, as if you have to explain that point to someone and then you definitely get it. That's the ultimate level. One of the things that impressed me is that you address your communication to a specific target audience. And that is a good thing and a bad thing. It's good because you can build a strong relationship with uh, your followers. But it's bad because you have to exclude everyone who doesn't speak Romanian. I can understand you because I understand Romanian, otherwise I would be cut off. In English speaking countries, most of the time um, we have cultural diversity among students and we use English to teach English. We are forced to um, keep our communication on a very basic level. For example, it's very difficult to make a joke. In your channel, you use a lot of humor. What do you think are the main differences about teaching English using the language of your students and teaching English using English? It's very different, but for the beginning, I'd have to make it clear uh, kind of the reason I started to teach uh, or to have this YouTube channel. And not only the YouTube channel, I actually started uh, teaching on Instagram first, like in 2018. That was, I was uh, teaching on Facebook, um, like, um, you know, it was basically a couple videos a year. So it wasn't really uh, working or having lots of uh, content there. but. Uh, in 2018, I started having uh, or posting uh, videos on, on my Instagram account day, on a daily basis. And then I switched to YouTube and then TikTok. So I have these three uh, social media accounts that I'm using right now. And um, it's funny because I didn't start the account, the YouTube account per se, uh, for the reason of growing or becoming an influencer or, I don't know, monetizing the channel as many people do. And I'm not judging because 
you know, everyone has their reasons. I'm not, uh, not saying it's the wrong way to go on YouTube, but I started it because I've realized that there are so many channels and videos that are made by native speakers and not only native speakers, but are purely in English. And there is uh, roughly nothing in Romanian. And so the average consumer uh, from our country, from Moldova and from Romania, I consider it pretty much the same thing because we're neighbors, different countries, but we speak the same language, we have a common history. And so the average consumer here doesn't really have any to, or didn't, yeah, up, up until the moment I uh, started my channels, um, didn't have any option of studying English online using Romanian, which is their mother tongue. And so I was like, well, that's what I'm going to do because I have this passion in teaching and uh, helping people. And the only way I could have gotten to many, uh, to a large audience would be, would have been to use Romanian and it still is. But it's funny because in the actual learning process in my school in Fantastic English and both on my um, project for Rita Ingleza, which is uh, the Romanian word for English, Rita English, yes, but spelled out it's E-N-G-L-E-Z-A. So uh, contrary to that, we use predominantly English, both at Fantastic English and in my own projects where I teach online courses. So that's the kind of, you know, paradox here. Um, I, I've been a teacher for the past 10 years. And uh, uh, we, I and my colleagues, we only use Romanian in the very beginning, when they're beginners, elementary maximum. Starting the A2 level, and I mean to say A2 because everyone knows what CFR is and it will be easier because for somebody, you know, that's a problem with the level. Elementary for somebody is a beginner and for someone is a pre-intermediate. I'm like, no, 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 let's talk about the A1, A2. So starting from the A2 level, people, are, students are perfectly fine to, to uh, use only English if it's a simplified language. And we are, we are, we're aware of that and that's what we're doing. But contrary to that, on the YouTube channel, I cannot speak only English because, come on, there are so many other teachers, native speakers, you know, like content creators who already do that. And so I thought, I have to bring something different to the market. You know, I can't just do the same thing that everyone is doing. And that's how I ended up using uh, Romanian predominantly there. But uh, I'm going to uh, stress this even more. Um, we don't do that in our uh, school, starting the, brain the elementary brain to mid level. It's not that we don't do that um, and uh, we have a choice. We don't e actually even have a choice because um, as a founder of the school and uh, well, we have the head teachers in the departments that we have, there's general English, uh, international exams, English department and the uh, English for t uh, kids and teens. Um, they have uh, their teachers and their team and they have to make sure that that's what's happening. But on a school level, we have this rule. We cannot use Romanian in teaching starting the elementary level with minor exceptions if we talk about, for example, elementary level, an abstract work, a word, and if that creates sort of a frustration or confusion in students, then we could go ahead and write it on the board or ask a student to translate it, but we have the rule of not using it ourselves so that the student associates us with English predominantly and this environment helps them learn even faster and better. And I'm sure you know it. Yes. So what you are saying is that you're using two different strategies. One is uh, using plain English when you're local, when, when you're in your school. And when you are on YouTube and you have access to a greater audience, instead of addressing your communication to as many people as possible, you select a niche audience, a very specific audience. And I think this is an aspect that many people mistake and might be the reason they are unsuccessful despite all of their efforts. It's better to be the big fish in the pond rather than uh, the small fish in the ocean. And you are successful because you focus your communication on your target audience. Probably, yeah, but um, there is no way I would know. Either way, I wouldn't do it otherwise because if I spoke only English, that would be a kind of a filter for the vast majority who, well, come on, people don't go on YouTube for, uh, real learning they do want it's not actually education is edutainment if you are familiar with the term uh, it's educational and ed education and entertainment combined that's what people are on youtube for especially on channels such as mine so 
I am perfectly aware of that. So why would I try to change the customer, beha the, uh, the behavior of the um, consumer from YouTube? So I adjust, I do use English, but I speak their language. And then if they really have that desire to have not edutainment, but education, they come to our school, they come to our courses. So how much having a successful YouTube channel influenced your activities in your schools? I mean, is opening a YouTube channel a viable solution for a newly qualified teacher who is just starting out? Um, definitely a viable solution. I'd have to say that uh, I, there, there hasn't been a moment I regretted opening the YouTube channel or TikTok or my Instagram, although it is really time consuming. Um, I, I started doing that when my child were, was six months old and I do have my regrets not uh, connected to the content I created, but to the fact that I, I wasn't able to be with my child as much. But at the same time, I did that because I wanted to, you know, to be both here and there, and uh, somehow I succeeded. And so um, this is not, it's not, I wouldn't say it's, um, it's a mandatory thing. I would not uh, make it as a strict recommendation for a school to have the YouTube channel, because that doesn't, you know, it, it I don't think it works for everyone. You don't have the path to success that works for every single person or every single company or a language school, but it sure helps the company, it sure does. Because uh, once you get to public and uh, not only you have the channel, but you are relevant, you're posting content that is engaging, that people love, then it goes without saying that your uh, brand awareness grows and that your um, customer is much, it, it's kind of, you know, they say in sales, they have this term is warmer. It warms up your customer because he's already acquainted to you. He, he's already seen you and um, he trusts you. People watch me on YouTube and when I meet them in school, they're like, I feel like I know you for years, you know, although we meet for the first time and it's amazing that we can create that connection with that many people using this tool. So I'd say that YouTube, as well as TikTok and Instagram or any other channels uh, are considered, I consider them a, an ama a fantastic tool for both helping people out because this is what we're doing as educators and for uh, promoting your business if that's what you're looking for. But I didn't start the channel for promoting my business, which is, weird but it's true i just started because i wanted to do it. i have no target like let me open a youtube channel so that i can have uh, 50k subscribers no idea i i have i didn't think about that at all and people very often now at this stage they kind of you know are skeptical when i say that They're, they don't believe me like how come not i mean didn't you have this expectation you become an influencer or first of all i'm not an influencer <laughs> second of all no i didn't have it i was like i just want to do it and that's what I believe in. If you, if you throw it out there in the universe and you have it, you do it with your best intention without expecting an outcome or a result, a certain result back, then uh, the results will come automatically just because you've uh, thrown into the universe the right thing. That's I think, what I believe uh, in. Yes, yeah, so you're using your passion. It's the passion that you have that motivates you more than thinking about business. The business and the money will come later if we transmit this passion. And in fact, your videos... I wanted to say that it is. it would be excellent if in a company there would be both of these combined because that's how what makes the company growing. And in my case, the co-founder of the school, my husband actually, he's in charge of the um, operation, operations of the company. He's the CEO and COO, both. The, both positions are his. So... Um, I'm the emotion part of the business and the passion and the, um, you know, the why of the company. He's the how, how we do that. And so when these two, two are combined, it's going to go, you can't have just this. You have to have the strategies and the steps for growing uh, to that. But uh, I am absolutely uh, positive that if a person opens a YouTube channel for the sake of growing a business only, he's going to fail. Because if that's the only thing, he, if that, um, that motivation is not going to keep him motivated long enough, it will run out eventually. You, the person might experience a burnout or if he doesn't expect the, if he doesn't see the expected results, you know, the motivation will go down and so will the passion and the, uh, the, the, the energy that you send through these videos. And so it has to be both, but I would say that the passion is more important. Gotta have it. And 
send it out there? I think it's uh, very important to have a good team. Most of the time, especially when uh, we are creative people, we start a project and then it grows. And all of a sudden we realize that we reached our limit. And this is why I think the relationship with uh, your husband is so important. We actually made, have made videos together. We translated songs from Romanian into English. <laughs> yes. It's very funny because, you know, the typical traditional Mold Moldovan songs, our dances, and when you translate them to English, it sounds ridiculous, but we did that. It was very funny. I would like to understand a bit more about his involvement in uh, your activities. Is he your editor or how does it work exactly? Um, initially, uh, uh, when I set out on this journey, um, I started uh, shooting the videos on my phone. This very phone, actually, I haven't changed it because I'm a, I'm a minimalist and I don't uh, encourage consumerism. But what I meant to say is that I shot the videos on my phone and I edited them myself and I was posting them myself but it took a lot of time. I was at the same time, not just a YouTuber or Instagrammer. I had the school that I had to grow. Um, at that time, we had around three, 400 customers enrolled in our school and they would change every two months. And obviously now we're bigger. And so initially it was me. Later on, I hired an editor, a marketing specialist. So actually don't do it alone. I have a, mar a, a team behind me that helps me with that. And uh, I was very careful to choose the right people just like I'm careful to choose the right uh, people in fantastic English who are dealing with education. Um, I'm also careful to choose the right people on the, who work with me on my social media accounts. Um, but I still have to be in charge of coordinating this operation. He doesn't edit the videos. He's in charge of the school, of the, um, the uh, all the departments, a sales department, HR, partly he's in charge of the marketing department in terms of uh, customer communication, payment systems, uh, CRM, customer relationship management. There's a lot of things that I would not manage to mention in an hour that need to be done in a company. Um, and uh, I have to thank him for bringing that value to the company because he's always been the technical entrepreneur of the company. I've always been the soul of the company. He's been the, as I said, the how. How we do this. This is the, this is the way we're going to get there. And he applied those, um, those strategies, uh, business strategies predominantly. So who is the mind behind uh, your videos? Because your videos are very me, complex. Completely me. Yeah, my, my account is completely me. The videos are completely me. Again, I create the content. I uh, write the, the, like, the ideas for the videos, the script. Uh, I talk to the editing guy. I always... Uh, give feedback for my videos because I get, get drafts, I watch them, I say what has to be cut, uh, cut off, what has to be added. Since I have this uh, experience in editing myself, and probably it's not the editing experience, it's more the sort of uh, personality that I have because I always had, uh, I, I like beautiful things and I sort of feel when a video is done right. And being a consumer on social media today, you kind of learn what works and what doesn't, especially when you're the mega mind of a, of a, of a content, uh, of a YouTube channel yourself. And so I connect all these elements and I show them or I use them in um, the work we do on YouTube, TikTok and Instagram everywhere. Um, you know, like Steve Jobs said in the in a speech, I don't remember, was it at Stratford or somewhere? Stanford, he said yes. that he took a calligraphy course, uh, a calligraphy, calligraphy course when he decided he'd give up the university. I'm sure everybody knows this speech. So at that time, it made no sense. Why would he do a calligraphy course? He didn't need that, but he did it for, for some reason. He liked it. And then eventually, like years after that, when they produced the first uh, Macintosh, uh, he got the chance to... Uh, to use those skills and to create those fonts that we are currently using. And so I remember this phrase distinctively, and I love it. Eventually, the dots connect backwards. That's what happens in my, that, that's what's happening in my case, I guess. I'm not a video editor, but the dots connect backwards. Everything I did, everything I saw and I worked up until now, I have the chance to, uh, to implement today, which is amazing. It's, it's good that you can connect these experiences. I connect completely with you. And I think this is uh, um, a very important issue today. So the, the market wants us to be very specific. The problem that I had in my professional life was 
that I was too generic. I was uh, a writer, a filmmaker, um, a graphic designer, an editor, a teacher. And if you are looking for a job with that kind of CV, it's very difficult to get it. But if you have something in mind, um, a project that you want to build, that is a completely different story. How much time do you dedicate to your YouTube channel and uh, social media per week? You know, it varies. There are weeks when I uh, work like seven hours a day on creating the content. And there are weeks when I don't do anything at all for them, except answer the comments and talk to my, uh, talk to my sub subscribers or followers on Instagram and TikTok. And so it really varies. I, it's really hard for me to give an average number because I'm always on call when I get a notification or I, I, I try to spend a lot, around an hour a day to answer messages. But I have to be fair, sometimes it's much more especially when I have live videos on YouTube or on Instagram, it's like after I finish those live videos, I have an avalanche of questions and answers. It sort of engages the, the community. And so I am there for hours in a row. And it's been always like that. I would put my daughter to sleep at 10 o'clock in the evening and then continue answering the messages for around two hours. And it happened a lot of times. Um, I have to say that I try to be, as a YouTuber, uh, one thing that I've noticed what works for this, uh, um, for this platform is the consistency. And so I uh, made a promise to myself last year in January that I would post a video every single week on a Wednesday at eight o'clock in the evening. So I actually did the dots connect backwards. I knew that because I, I did an uh, online course on how to promote your YouTube account, which is not connected to education at all, but I did it just like the calligraphy, calligraphy, calligraphy course, you see. So I uh, started producing and uh, creating these videos in advance so that I had them. But um, I'm not, again, I'll have to stress this, I'm not a YouTuber or TikToker or Instagrammer. That is a hobby and that is completely part-time. I'm a school founder, I have 55 employees. I have an online language school where I have to be. And so... Obviously, I'm both here and there, but I'm much, 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 much more time. I'm, uh, I'm uh, involved in the process, in the, in the progress of the school, and in making it work, because that's where the customers are. You know, you can't be nice on YouTube and uh, neglect your customers. And uh, I try to create the videos in advance. I try to do that, like shoot two, three videos in a week and then have them uh, pending and being edited on time. And then the pandemic hit and I wasn't able to follow that schedule. And it was really tough because uh, we had to move out of the city because we were severely quarantined and I had my daughter and I could not shoot any videos with her in the house. Needless to say, could I work? I couldn't work at all. And I started shooting videos roughly everywhere, not in my studio. I would use my parents' house the balcony, outside, or anything just to do that. And the weirdest thing, the weirdest thing was that I, uh, the, the, the content became, um, not that it became better, it started creating higher engagement. And so I thought, maybe that's the secret. I don't have to, I don't have to uh, prepare a video for a week because probably I'm overdoing it. I have to make a video a day and uh, that's gonna be pretty much the same as if I worked on that video for a lot of time uh, and that conclusion helped me a lot because ever since then I improvise I uh, prepared the sketch I have some sort of notes and ideas but I have to be honest with you it's 99% improvised nothing you see in the videos is rehearsed read from a prompter or from a script it's completely improvised and it, it's a skill that I've been shaping in time. I wasn't able to do that two years ago, but I am now. Thanks to the fact that I just pushed myself to just do it, do it, do it. And then uh, it worked out fine. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing that's how uh, I could answer the question, how much time you spend. It's not about time. It's about the uh, involvement, the experience, and the um, energy you give into that. Can't tell you a number. No idea. It's like... I dedicate my time to education and I do that 24 seven. It's not like I have a schedule. I have no schedule. I can think about uh, my students from my current online course at two o'clock at night. 
and I'm thinking, what can I do better to engage them? And so I am, came up with the system of gamification. And I'm very excited because I'm going to announce it on Saturday. And so they will receive gifts from me. And it's, again, something I came up with at 2 o'clock at night. Is this okay? It's not. Is this the so, way I like it? It is. So wait, uh, can you take it out? Because uh, this is something that I didn't know. So can you show us uh, gamification? Yeah. This is something that I didn't idea. know about. You know, can you put it on camera? Uh, what sure. is this exactly? Yes. Um, the, the cover has it in, in Romanian, but the inside is in English completely. So this is 100 words in English, a set of flashcards, complete, like custom made. It's, uh, I'm the author of this uh, creation, <laughs> if you call it so. These are flashcards. Okay, it actually shows it backwards, but I'm sure you're going to get that this is the almighty verb to be. And so what I do, what I did, this is, this is actually the, the experience of 10 years teaching. Um, I've always used flashcards with my students in class and then online as well. I recommend them to download apps. And actually, I'm not a fan of apps. I tell them, use the paper because when you write it down, you're much more likely to remember. And I made these because a lot of people ask me like, why don't you make a set of flashcards that would be on your own? Like, wait a minute, maybe I should do that. And so that's the verb, the verb to be, that you have the transcription, the way you pronounce it. We're going to have an app as well that comes with the QR code. So once you buy the flashcard, the box, you can download the app and also listen to the pronunciation of the verb and examples. Uh, underneath, we have the translation of the verbs. And on the back side, we have the was, where, been. So we have infinitive, past, simple, past, participle and examples with the verb form in the past simple and in past participle. This is a list of 100 most common verbs in English and the ones that I've uh, been using for the past years. So this is predominantly for beginner elementary level to learn the verbs contextually, present, past, um, and past participle. Usually it's, past, uh, it's the, the example in past simple, obviously, in this column is always past simple, but here we can use present perfect or passive voice, the most common constructions that use past participle. Uh, and the aim of these cards is to learn both the infinitive form, the past simple, past participle, and the pronunciation. And it's fun because they're cute and it's yellow and you like using them. And uh, I, we have them on sale, like uh, online, not yet in distribution worldwide, but we will um soon on amazon but my students get it as a gift once they complete a certain set of lessons and so i'm um, very very excited about it i thought if about that last night at 2 a.m so i just remembered <laughs> <laughs> if you give me the link we will put it in uh, the description so maybe somebody wants to buy them i don't have it yet on amazon but when i do i'll sh i sure will <laughs> okay it's just local it's hard to take it at worldwide ah okay, uh, okay. I recall the, the book, I think uh, the title was Poor That, Rich That, or Rich That, Poor That, I don't remember, by Robert, Robert Kiyosaki. And uh, he was doing a mm -hmm. seminar about uh, McDonald's. Um, he was talking to students and he said, how many of you know McDonald's? And all of them raised their hands. Okay, how many of you think that they can do better hamburgers than McDonald's? And all of them raised their hands. And then he said, <laughs> and then he said okay, how come... Uh, McDonald's is rich and you are poor. And this is a very important thing. So I think most of the times we put all of our energy in improving ourselves and not enough energy in selling ourselves. How much creative you are and how much sales of a person uh, are you? It's, it's really, um, again, I'll have to start with the fact that uh, the reason... Um, and it's still, it still is the reason for uh, working on or posting or creating this free content on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram was not to attract customers, but this is the outcome. And so when you really believe in what you do and you do it right, it has to come uh, as a result. However, you have to have a, mar a well-established marketing system in place. And that's definitely not something I would do on my own. Uh, I have to say that I'm not just an English language teacher, uh, YouTuber, or for example, school founder. I'm also an entrepreneur and I do a lot of reading on that. I, um, I think if you check my, uh, my library at home, then 80% of the books are on entrepreneurship. 
So uh, we read both me and my husband, uh, both we, we read how could we uh, systematize some actions in our school, uh, the departments that we have, how we delegate what we delegate and how we check on that. And so there is like, it's, it's, in, it's a lot of mechanisms that are set into place, but to put it simply, uh, you have to follow the, you have to have the proper people on the team. That's very important. And then when you find the right people, you have to make sure that they know what they have to do because the person can be amazing, can be very talented, but if he's not placed or he's not given the right position, he's not going to yield a good result. So um, having the right people on the team and then uh, giving them or having it clear what they have to do, uh, having the work procedure set in place the department set, set in place and the communication between departments, departments would be the crucial thing here. And so we have the marketing department and sales department, if to answer your questions, strictly connected to each other. They continuously communicate. I'm the head of the marketing department in school. I have the team as well. Um, and my husband is the head of the, the CEO, but we have the head of the sales team. And so we constantly communicate with the, what's happening with the, uh, between the uh, um, offer and demand, if, if to put it in simpler terms. Yes, what can we offer as a school? We can offer 1,000 uh, slots for online courses in a matter of two months, yes, because they enroll every two months, we have new customers. Okay, so that's the offer. What, do, like, what, is, the, what is the demand on the market and can we, um, can we fill that in? It's that the good news for us is that we are always overbooked. We always we, we don't have the problem of uh, forming the groups uh, or uh, delivering the, the course for students per se. Uh, but this is a continual communication. I mean, we talk on a daily basis. Daily, we check our accounts. We have our managers. We check on our managers. We see how it's going. And so we keep... It, uh, it's like an expression that I like using. It's more of a Romanian expression, but I'll use it. We like to keep our hand on the pulse. So I know what's happening on a daily basis. Strict control. And that's, that's what uh, a successful company needs. Based only on passion and energy, you can't do it. Based only on the system, you can't. You have to combine them. Good. As I said, we have 55 people in our company, out of which 37 are teachers. And so obviously the rest are either sales managers, heads of departments, coordinators, uh, quality control managers, uh, people who communicate on social media and answer the messages. There's um, outsourcing some uh, services such as, uh, I don't know, like the integration, for example, of integrating a widget from the website with our CRM. It's, it's things that, you know, not, there, there is no way in the world two or three people would be able to do. It takes a company for that. And we got to this moment after having read and set in place business systems, which we found from books. Thanks God there are books, <laughs> including Kiyosaki, like Richard Branson, a lot, a lot of them. Yes, yes. Uh, I see that we are reading the same books. Um, you mentioned your colleagues and uh, your team how do you manage your colleagues? I was thinking you're the face of uh, your company. And it's possible that at a certain point, some of, some of them, especially because you have more than 50 people around you, some of them could be sort of jealous because you're the celebrity and they feel that they are doing all the work. I don't think that happens. And if it does, I think it's just that those people who have that, it's... Um... I wouldn't say their problem because it is a company problem. And I'm very, very, very sh like 99% sure that it's not happening. Uh, the people who are here, we have a strong company culture and you are right. I am the face of the company, but there's a reason I do this. I don't do that for uh, feeding my ego or I don't know, because I want to be everywhere and I don't want to let anyone else uh, be the face of the company. It's just that I know how marketing functions and it is impossible to associate Apple with 10 different uh, people you associated with Steve Jobs. Yeah. And knowing that, I implement that. 
people in my company love the fact that they are part of this team that is so popular online that has such a founder because I inspire them. I don't take it as a, uh, um, you know, I'm your boss and you got to do what I tell you. And this is the way it's going to work. We are not actually having this pyramid system that here's the boss, head teacher, and blah, blah, blah. It's very, le- it's very linear. It's very, um, I, when I talk about my, uh, the people on my team, I never say my employees. I hate that word. When I refer to them, I say my colleagues. Even when I talk to my uh, subscribers or followers, I tell them one of my colleagues is going to get in touch with you because I see them as colleagues. And so whoever doesn't see that about me or uh, sees me as as a problem or is kind of envious of this, and this is his problem because I definitely don't send this message. And so I I don't think it happens. It's about the communication. It's about the the way I act around these people, the way they are being uh, uh, coordinated by their head teachers. Uh, you cannot have a tribe of 100 people surviving without a leader. You have to have a leader. And so when they accept their leader, I think uh, it's uh, a win-win situation. Yes, I agree with you. Um, last thing, how do we find you if we want to learn English with you? So you can find me on my YouTube channel. We've been talking about this channel a lot lately uh, in this interview. The YouTube channel is Rita Inglesa. That would be the pronunciation in Romanian. So Rita or Rita, yes, if you want me to pronounce it in English. And Inglesa is actually the word for English in Romanian. And I'm going to spell that out. Uh, E-N-G-L-E-Z-A. Uh, and the exact same name you can use for TikTok and Instagram. I mean, I have the same, uh, same, uh, same nickname to call it. So I also have a TikTok channel, which I opened accidentally. <laughs> and I'm not working on it accidentally anymore. I love it. Uh, which is part of the adaptability thing I was talking about. And also the Instagram where I, um, the only chance for people to text me in person and to talk to me is Instagram because we have a DM, uh, which you can't do on TikTok. There is thousands of comments and I lose track of them. Same for YouTube. So if you want to text me in person, you can use my Instagram or my email address, but I honestly hate the email. I don't use it that often. If I'm a person who doesn't even read CVs, imagine what I do with the email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I've moved forward with the other account. That, that's just me, I guess. So these three accounts you can find me on. Okay. This is very, again, very interesting because at the moment I hate TikTok and I advise people not to use them because I think it's evil. But if you say so, and I agreed with you for the whole interview, I think I will have a rethought about that and I will adapt to the new standards. Do you have a website we can check? Yes, absolutely. Um, You said you, and uh, you see what the thing is here. I am still, uh, English is my second language. Anyway, regardless of the, I am C2. I took the C2 certificate last year in Cambridge C2. But when you said, well, how can we find you? I automatically assumed you're talking about me. And so I mentioned to talk about my school, which is my most important project I've ever worked on. Fantastic English is the school I founded. Um, you can find it like that on Google, Fantastic English. It's fantasticenglish.md, uh, same name, it's in English, which is weird because Rita Inglesa is in Romanian, but Fantastic English is spelled out in English. Um, we also have a Facebook page uh, and the website, which I've just mentioned, but make sure you write it uh, with a hyphen, fantastic-english.md. Uh, our website, where we, by the way, have the section for um, HR, and you can apply for a job as well. Um, at the same time, the phone number you can call, but I think people will like would like to contact me in person, which I'm fine with, because I'm always there for this. Okay. Make it more personal. Thank you very much, Rita. It's been uh, a pleasure to, uh, to spend some time with you, and we have a lot of material to work on. It's been a pleasure as well, an immense pleasure for me. I really hope that uh, I'm gonna, it would, like the interview or the things that I've shared today, a lot of them are not really uh, so out there because people don't ask me about that. And so I want to have the chance to give out to the community because I feel like I can. And so I really hope that it's useful for, for the teachers who are watching this. And not only for teachers, maybe for potential teachers or potential workers in the, uh, learning languages.
And that's all for today. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up. If you think you have something important to share with uh, the TEFL community, uh, please write at us at editorial at galleryteachers.com. If you want to write an article for our blog or maybe you want to be interviewed for this channel, please visit our website at galleryteachers.com. Thank you for watching us and as usual, happy teaching and happy learning.